Hello and welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onoye Onye, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase scientific innovation stemming from global life science companies through conversations with senior leaders who share their unique leadership journey, corporate vision, and industry outlook. My guest today is Dr. Stephanie Manson Brown, a board certified plastic surgeon who leads a clinical development organization at Allegan Aesthetics and at the company. Stephanie and her team are responsible for global clinical trial development strategy for the aesthetics portfolio, covering both pharmaceuticals and medical devices. She's also the main sponsor of the digital science technology program for aesthetic medicine. Excitingly, Stephanie sits on the Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion Council at Allegan Aesthetics and is currently leading and driving an initiative to address diversity in clinical trials in aesthetic medicine. Stephanie also has extensive experiences in medical affairs and prior to her current role, she led the Global Medical Affairs Organizations for Aesthetics at Allegan. She has also held multiple positions within medical affairs, covering diverse therapeutic areas such as aesthetic medicine, neuroscience, cardiology, hand surgery, as well as diabetes. In addition, she supported the UK government affairs team while at Pfizer and worked as a medical advisor for Nova Nordisk. As if that's not impressive enough, Stephanie is the founder of the Science of Aging Symposium, and I'm delighted to share that I participated in this year's Science of Aging Virtual Symposium. In fact, Stephanie and I connected via the Science of Aging LinkedIn page based on our shared experiences as women in science and leaders. I am incredibly excited to have her on the show as my first big fan of senior leader. Welcome mm -hmm. to the show, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Sophia. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of your show. I'm very grateful for the invite and um, thank you for your kind introduction. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. You've done so much. And, and like I said, it's an honor to have you on the show as well. Um, but I'm going to start with what I always call my favorite question. I'm sure I have a couple of favorite questions, but I like this one. Um, what is your definition of scientific innovation? Yeah. Okay. That's a good one to start with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, innovation is really interesting, isn't it? Because it can be, it can manifest in so many different ways and it can be something big or it can be something radical and it can also maybe be something um, incremental, um, also disruptive. Um, and so, you know, I think when I think about scientific innovation, I try and think about it from all those different angles um, and there's so many different examples I mean my goodness I think we're both very lucky that we found our, our passion in science because there's so much happening and and so many innovations so many developments um, and you know I was thinking about um, your podcast in preparation and, and one of them I thought I was thinking about, you know, which one do I choose? And I, I could have <laughs> easily talked about Botox because obviously, you yeah. know, that is something that is a huge fundamental um, pillar of what I do in aesthetic medicine, working for Allegan Aesthetics, um, now an AbbVie company. Um, but, you know, th th that has been discussed um, extensively and it is, I think it still is one of those fundamental disruptive um, innovations and really the discovery around the application to so many different indications. Um, and that's something that often people just associate it with the aesthetic um, indications around facial wrinkles for example but it can be applied to migraines um, overactive bladder um, mm -hmm. spasticity you know the, the list goes on and we're continuing to expand and, and find ways that we can apply it to therapeutic uses as well as aesthetic medicine um, but one of the innovations I was thinking about recently was around and it, it speaks very much to the science of aging which you mentioned earlier um, and it's around this development of deep aging clocks um, mm -hmm. and really kind of trying to develop biomarkers around aging. Um, mm -hmm. And so just was doing a little bit, you know, there's a lot of um, noise around that and a lot of, um, you know, groups 
further mm. developing them and refining them. Um, but when I was reading about Steve Horvath, um, he was really kind of the, the pioneer here. Um, and yeah. he's a biostatistician who um, really kind of was, you know, instrumental in developing the first epigenetic um, aging clock. And, and he actually happened upon it, as he says, by fortuitous accident. Right. Right. Um, right. So I thought that that was fascinating, um, given wow. the fact that he a colleague had asked him to look at methylization, um, sorry, methylate, methylation um, and whether it correlated with sexual orientation, which he said, said that there was no connection. But he thought, let's have a look at it with aging. And, and really, the rest is history. He, he saw that there was a really, really strong signal and then has you know, first published in 2011 and then has further, you know, refined um, and, and, you know, further developed the technique. And, and really, it's, it's an area that I think is a very useful tool. And I think it will develop, you know, even further to be able to allow us to better measure aging. So that to me was just a kind of a mind blowing um, innovation that happened by chance, I guess. Yeah, serendipity is so powerful. I, I feel like it's the secret sauce to scientific innovation or any, in, any innovation at that. Um, some of my best ideas come when I'm taking a shower, but you, you never know. Like, <laughs> that's just really how it works out. So thank yeah. you for that. Um, so the follow-up question I have for you is, you know, I've done some research on you, obviously, and mm -hmm. I know you've done so much, and it's so interesting sort of, you know, your background and your diverse disease state experience. But I'm curious to know what you would consider to be your most significant professional or, or scientific or even clinical achievement to date. Yeah. Um, oh, gosh. I think, you know, thinking about it and, um, you know, kind of keeping it relative, I'm really, really proud of the science of aging. Um, and I yeah. really want to bring it back to that. Um, and I guess you could put that in professional, but it does, I think, also sort of tie in with the scientific side. And the reason being is that it is really, truly unique. Um, mm -hmm. It is something, it's a platform that really the inception of it was based on bringing high caliber science to aesthetic medicine. And really, you know, taking a step back and kind of seeing what is it that we could be applying, mm. for, you know, with regards to the future. And, and there's so much happening in the field of aging science and longevity. I mean, it's really exploded in the last five, maybe a little bit longer, but certainly the last five years um, plus. And so, you know, the skin is the largest organ. Um, and I think there was a little bit of a lack of linking um, what mm. was happening in the aging science world um, to mm. Um, skin biology, um, although mm. it is used um, quite often as a, as a model to be able to better understand um, targets and better understand the effects of some of the therapeutic um, compounds that are being used. So really kind of, and, and initially when I thought came up with the concept, it was more to do with um, being, I, I mean, it was a, due to a number of factors, but one of them was just that there seemed to be a little bit of a lack of really you know, good basic science and, and translational mm. science in aesthetic mm. medicine. It existed, but it mm -hmm. wasn't always there at the forefront when I was attending conferences. And so it was really kind of just to tap into that. Because as I say, it does exist and there's a lot of companies and a lot of startups out there doing incredible stuff and there that is applicable and to aesthetic medicine um, and also researchers who are looking at different aspects, you know, kind of basing a lot of the research around the hallmarks of aging. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the idea was to bring it together and, and to, mm -hmm. you know, create a platform so that you can bring like-minded and passionate people in this field of aging um, research and longevity research and the experts in aesthetic medicine mm. and really kind of bring the two worlds together which has been really an explosion of ideas and, and it's been very well received I would say and I think that there is something um, well, there's multiple different avenues I think we can explore. And so, you know, certainly looking at it from our company perspective, I think that there's some really exciting partnerships um, that will come through this platform. But it's also just about really um, providing the narrative, providing the, the latest research and um, to right. um, our doctors and, and also, you know, bringing the researchers into this field that perhaps they wouldn't have necessarily thought that they would, um, their, their past would have crossed so directly into aesthetic medicine. Um, and I think um, I was speaking to one of our um, investigators, she's based um, in the US in New Orleans last week. And, and one of the really great things she said is that, you know, having 
you know, being being on the um, I joined the symposium last week. She said it just makes me think differently as a doctor. You know, she she was looking at a lot of medical dermatology, but you know, this is about thinking about the future and and thinking about the cellular and molecular level and all the different pathways associated with aging and and really you know looking into the future of what what the possibilities are. I think that that's impeccable. As I mentioned earlier, I attended the symposium this year and I was, I was blown away by the diversity of topics. And it's funny because when think, people think about aesthetic medicine, they tend to look at it as almost superficial. They don't mm -hmm. understand the depth of what yeah. goes into the, the field itself. So just, uh, I'm curious to know, obviously, uh, what were some of the challenges with even having a virtual symposium this year? I'm yeah. sure that was difficult behind the scenes to navigate. Yes. Oh my goodness, you, you, you um, really <laughs> kind of, you know, um, landed on an area that was um, interesting. So first of all, thank you for attending, and and I love hearing your feedback. It was really great to take on board, um, and and. Um, you know, where we, we normally, so, so it's really still very much in its infancy. Um, this was only the second year running with the scientific symposium. I and mean, we've set up the LinkedIn community and an Instagram community behind it to continue that narrative. But really the perfect, you know, one of the kind of the main points is to bring that energy together with the symposium. So we ran it last year in Monaco, which is a lovely <laughs> location, but it was, a, <laughs> which I think might have been a draw for some of our faculty members um, who otherwise might not have said yes um, but um, we ran it in Monaco in conjunction with um, one of the conferences it's, um, it, it takes place in Monaco which is the anti-aging world mm -hmm. medicine um, conference um, and obviously the pandemic hit it has impacted all of us um, and so you know it, it, we were planning to run the face-to-face um, -face event um, end of March beginning of April this year and it was right when everything yeah. started to all the different, you know, you could see the kind of the, I guess, the um, wave of countries starting to go into lockdown. So um, we just thought, actually, you know, let's turn this into an opportunity. Let's look at the virtual option. Um, and at the time, I mean, I think even within the, the, the months, um, you know, uh, pre uh, preceding March was that there was a lot of, um, I think, so, you know, kind of further development of the virtual platforms. I mean, we were lucky. We partnered with some excellent agencies who introduced us to the group who provided our virtual platform. Um, but, you know, one of the elements was that we just wanted to make sure we were absolutely prepared and, mm -hmm. you know, connected with all of our speakers, um, mm -hmm. going through all the presentations, checking the connectivity <laughs> and the <laughs> with, um, of, of all of our speakers. Um, and actually, it's interesting. I think at the end, um, my my closing speech, my my the image of my <laughs> video wasn't great, um, but it was something that it, it we we did realise that it could be challenging, especially in nowadays. People are getting a lot of Zoom fatigue. I think that's probably going to be a a term of 2020, or certainly and um, video conferencing fatigue. So we thought actually we could risk, you know, potentially not having very many people attend because there were so many different um, virtual um, events popping up all over the place. But um, it actually ended up really, you know, going, going incredibly well. I mean, I, I know I'm biased from saying that, but I was very <laughs> pleased at how it ran. Mm -hmm. And as I say, mm -hmm. it was turning it into an opportunity. It means that we could access and make it accessible mm -hmm. to attendees who were, you know situated all over the globe and so um you know it meant that people who may not have been able to attend the monaco face-to-face -face right. event um, and right. had the opportunity to do so so it's something that i think like this is the future right and i think that the, the whole impact of covid and the pandemic has kind of kick-started a lot of us into thinking <laughs> we need to be much better equipped from a virtual point of view and and you know I think certainly moving forward is lovely having the face-to-face -face event and you can do the networking and, and you know, right. this, you, can't, you can't replace face-to-face -face contact, but you know, this does give us an opportunity to look at running hybrid, hybrid events in the future. Right, and it goes back to what you said earlier about innovation and serendipity. In addition mm -hmm. to that, you also talked about the importance of building synergies, building relationships with people. That's really what makes the world go around, literally. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I want to go back a few steps and I'm always curious about what attracts people to what they do. So what mm -hmm. attracted you to aesthetic medicine? 
Oh, another great question. Um, <laughs> so as you mentioned earlier, um, I'm a plastic surgeon by training. Um, and actually, I think, you know, initially, I mean, I knew that I wanted to be a surgeon from a very early age. Um, I, I think what triggered it in me, I, mean, I think, I think at the beginning, I wanted to be a car mechanic. And then I decided that actually I wanted to apply my practical skills to, to humans and do some good from that side of things. And I love science at school, as I'm sure you did. And um, well, obviously you did. Um, and, um, and so I kind of, I think what I was first attracted to from a plastic surgery point of view was just really the creativity that you can apply in plastic surgery and really making I mean any um, specialty in medicine you can make such a difference in patient life but it was that creativity and I was actually more attracted to the reconstructive side of things um, initially um, mm -hmm. but then I through multiple reasons left um, clinical practice and, and ended up leaving um, my, my, my clinical practice as a plastic surgeon and, mm -hmm. and then the opportunity came up to to join um, Allergan Aesthetics and I've been with Allergan now for just over six years um, and it was I didn't think that I would be able to translate translate and transfer my skills as a plastic surgeon into industry necessarily because mm. often it is more kind of the bigger medical therapeutic areas that um, are the ones that get more attention um, so joining a company um, you know the famous company with Botox was um was just such a, um, opportunity yes. and, and aesthetic medicine it's something actually you know it is aesthetic medicine is actually quite a relatively new term that we're applying and it, it's something that really speaks to the fact that it is a specialist mm -hmm. area of medicine you know and and it is something that has got a skill set up, um, applied to it and there's there's a whole you know, there's so many different avenues of research and innovation going on at the minute with regards to introducing new developments, new technology to the space. Um, and what interests me and continues to make me passionate about aesthetic medicine is that, you know, that this um, focus on quality of life, you know, mm -hmm. you know we, we are bringing change mm -hmm. um, to mm -hmm. people's lives where, um, you know, giving people the opportunity to enhance their lives. Um, and it, is not just about you know the beauty concept. I mean, it goes way deeper, and I think that that is really you know beginning to be recognised. And I work with fantastic teams in in the in the company, and um, my colleagues who work on developing the patient reported outcome measures to really be able to um, speak to the psychosocial impact, which you know at the end of the day yeah. is something that is you know I, I once again I, I don't think that um, many people stop to really kind of um, recognise that if they don't understand aesthetic medicine. Um, and yeah. it's not this frivolous, you know, kind of um, pursuit of beauty. It, for some people, they do want, that's one of their drivers. But for um, a lot of people seeking aesthetic medicine treatments, it is to make themselves look less tired or less angry and um, to make <laughs> them feel like a better, you know, to make them feel better within themselves. And, and that's something that we are now being, you know, we're able to demonstrate that there is a correlation um, to improvement in um, quality of life and, and social cycle um, uh, or psychosocial aspect. Um, so, and I think there's, you know, there's a lot to to be done to advance the field, and and I think, you know, this is where we can be continuing to apply new developments with respect to endpoint and mm -hmm. development, and to be to to better able quantify what it is that the, um, you know, that the injectors in practice are able to do, because um, currently, what the way that we're regulated and the scales that we use are quite. They, they, you know, they don't often reflect the, the finesse that's used mm -hmm. in clinical practice. It can be quite yeah. a blunt tool, um, but obviously, you know, we, we need to demonstrate clear efficacy. So um, at the moment, mm -hmm. we're, we're not able to necessarily mm -hmm. translate directly um, some of the optimal, um, you know, outcomes that are applied in clinical practice. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, there, there's big scope as well to continue to look at um, how we can harness um, the developments in, in aging um, mm -hmm. research and, mm -hmm. and, and also kind of move away from this concept that, you know, it's just there to make people look younger. It's actually to help people, you know, feel better in themselves as we age longer. So, you know, we're all aging longer. So, so it's, right. it's, it's a great, it's going to be a great tool to kind of better equip people to be, you know, potentially working in their eighties. Let's, let, right. you know, let's be kind of honest with ourselves. Right. I love the whole concept of longevity because we are living longer. And to the point we both made earlier, aesthetic medicine is not just 
a superficial field. I think that there's a lot of depth in it. And mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of interdisciplinary collaborations within mm-hmm. the field. And regenerative medicine in particular is top of mind to me. At this point, I've had the pleasure of working with Copeland Biotechnology, yeah. who presented at a Science of Aging yeah. Symposium. So I'm curious to know about those types of fields, regenerative medicine, for example. How will that impact the future of aesthetic medicine? What collaborations are you seeing? What innovations are you seeing? Tell me more. I, I can't wait to hear. Yeah, I mean, so regenerative medicine is a fascinating field, and, and I loved, you know, having Cole Plant come um, and and now Dar. Um, Nada, sorry, I'm um, come and present, um, yes. you know, the, the technology that coal plant are developing. And, you know, I guess just um, I'm sure your your um, audience already know a little bit about coal plant because you work um, very closely with them. But I mean, they're, they're really um, doing some really interesting stuff with, um, you know, the um, human recombinant um, collagen and, and looking mm-hmm. at genetically engineering um, tobacco plants to be able to mm-hmm. uh, generate, um, you know, the, the, the collagen that can be applied to so many different aspects of medicine as well as aesthetic medicine Um, and so you know from a regenerative medicine point of view and that's something that also from our company point of view we've got um, you know the portfolio that does include um, acellular dermal matrices Mm -hmm. for example which are used Mm -hmm. in breast reconstruction so moving a little bit away from aesthetic medicine and more in the therapeutic side of breast reconstruction but I think that there's applications as well when we do look at it from a truly aesthetic um, perspective because you know you know, at the end of the day, you know, regenerative medicine is looking at tissue engineering. It's looking at, you know, restoring um, and regenerating regener- human tissue. And, and, and um, so that's something that kind of really does speak to some applications in aesthetic medicine and looking at tissue defects, for example, either from a traumatic point of view or um, a, a, a tumor resection perspective. And so that's where, you know, we can be looking at some of the biodegradable, or some of the um, scaffolds, sorry, and the biodegradable scaffolds that can be applied yeah. to it. Um, there's a we've, we're also working, and I think this is a, an area that you know there, it's it's. I mean, some people have called it the holy grail, but you know, hair <laughs> regeneration. Yes, that, that's something. Yes. That's something that is a fascinating field, and, and we've got quite a number of um, partnerships with um, mm-hmm. some of the companies who are really is you know continuing to and um, develop some really exciting innovations there. And, and one again, stem cell. They were they were part of our um, science of aging and um, faculty this year, um, mm-hmm. and a really fascinating presentation. But you know they're kind of looking at kind of a both um, stem cells, so pluripotent um, stem cells, and, and really kind of you know harnessing the ability to de- differentiate into dermal pillory cells, and but also implanting the, the cells in situ using micro scaffold, which mm-hmm. is a three D um, biodegraded uh, biodegradable scaffold. So you know there are so many really interesting applications, and and also I mean. I think you know wound healing is an area that that again we can uh, apply to aesthetic medicine um, mm-hmm. and you know looking at the application of scaffolds there, but also potentially you know seeing how we can intervene with the wound healing process. So there's a lot going on, um, and it's something you know from our point of view we're, we are very keen to um, continue developing from a regenerative medicine side of things. Wonderful. One of the things that fascinated me was your interest in diversity in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. I feel that that's impeccable, especially as it relates to aesthetic medicine. And I would love to know how that ties into your your vision for for your role at Allegan Aesthetics at Abbey. Can you please tell me more? Okay. So um, thank you for um, asking that. I mean, yes, I think diversity in clinical trials is absolutely, you know, it's, it's a an imperative um, that we we really need to address and and I think you know at the end of the day when when we you know look back and have a look at um you know the the way that generally aesthetic trials are set up you know mm-hmm. it's it's quite you know outstanding for the wrong reasons that the majority of patients are white female um mm-hmm. and um the American Society of Plastic Surgery do run um annual surveys to kind of better um, you know, understand or kind of to get a, a feel of the land and and, and um, evaluate the proportion of um, individuals and, and representation um, seeking aesthetic treatment. It does still sit very much with white females, but I yeah. don't think that it's truly reflective. And I've had um, some really great discussions with some of my investigators who themselves come from a diverse um, um, you know, background and or skin of color, and they actually have a, a diverse patient population. They're like, well, that doesn't reflect my pa- practice. So, right. you know, this is where, you know, we need to be um, ensuring that we are, um, you know, studying 
a diverse population and making sure that we are recognizing those who are underrepresented in clinical trials because it's, it's a vicious circle. If we're not studying the efficacy and the safety in people with different skin colors, then you know, it, 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 it's very difficult then for us to be able to then translate that into, you know, potentially um, you know, demonstrating clinical outcomes and then you know, kind of going further to take it to you know, advertising promotion and, and, and you know, um, formulating um, claims around that. So it's, it's a very, it's, it's a, as I say, it's a, it's a very necessary field. It is multi-layered. So it's, it's looking at you know, a diversity, diversifying the investigator pool, making sure that we're putting in the right support network to support mm. um, you know, some of the younger dermatologists, plastic surgeons who perhaps um, haven't been involved in clinical research, you know, tying on in some of the expertise and experience of our existing um, investigators to kind of help us develop and, and, and understand how we can put those you know, support networks in place. I'm um, looking at diverse patient populations. So that's something that you know, from a scientific and clinical trial perspective, we really need to um, ensure that we are very clear as to what does diversity look mm -hmm. like, you mm -hmm. know, and it is very much does base on, um, you know, the, the color of skin and race, ethnicity, but also looking at, you know, younger patients, older yeah. patients, gender, right. male and female, um, right. and also, you know, looking at transgender as well. So it's something that, you know, it has to have a very methodical, thought out, considerate approach. And so therefore that's why, um, it, you know, it needs to bring in all the different um, advisory capacity, but also really truly understand how we do make a difference rather than just, you know, looking at it superficially and, and saying, great, we've got a few more patients who perhaps fit under what we, and we use in, in, in device trials in particular in, in medical aesthetics, or sorry, aesthetic medicine and, and dermatology, the Fitzpatrick skin type um, category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that actually in itself was not set up necessarily to categorize people of different um, skin colors within um, a clinical trial. And it is very much weighted to the lighter skin types. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something, you know, that there is a lot of work to be done as well as of how we identify, how we do categorize and how we do make sure that we are articulating diversity in the appropriate manners to then be able to, you know, set up and, and, and um, increase the representation across the board. So it's certainly no um, small feat. It's something that I'm working with very closely with my counterparts. And we talk about, so Allegan Aesthetics, yes, we're AV, um, but you know, there's um, a group that sit in the R, R, um, AV R&D side. So we are looking at this from a kind of a bigger perspective, but also making sure that we are translating across to ensure that we are completely aligned. Um, but I think it is, I mean, it's relevant across the board, um, but um, it's something that, you know, we we need to, and, and I feel that it's such a big undertaking on, on aesthetic medicine because of the high representation of white females in our studies. Right, right. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more and honestly cannot add anything to what you just said because you articulated it very clearly. But I'm now curious about something else, and, and that's me and my life. Um, so you mentioned um, AbV. So obviously, Allegan existed independently prior to AbV. So how has that integration been and, and are you concerned at all about some of these great initiatives that you develop sort of getting lost in, in that integration I, I would love to hear more from you from that perspective yeah so i mean we're, we're still going through integrations you can imagine the size of the the companies coming together means that this will continue um you know probably a good couple of months, if not, you know, well into 2021 and, and beyond. But um, I think, you know, the, the, the overarching aspect of it is it was an incredibly exciting opportunity for us. I think there was, you know, the majority of us, and, and of course, yeah, I can't speak on behalf of every single person, but we were very excited at that pro prospect when um, the announcement um, was made public. Um, and really, you know, obviously there is, and, and I know certainly from um, being on the side of um, acquiring, you know, some of the companies that we've acquired in the past as, as Allergan, as a standalone company, it can be very challenging for colleagues to come in from smaller, more nimble, dynamic um, companies and some startup companies or smaller device companies to come into the, the foray of a bigger bigger beast that really has got a lot more processes, a lot more systems and a lot more kind of, you know, um, you know, I guess a, a greater scope with regards to mm -hmm. kind of the different focuses. And um, so it's something that is, you know, we're, we're now on that side and kind of being engulfed into a bigger company. But then um, this is something that on the Allegan Aesthetics, we have been set up as a 
as a separate entity, although there is very close, um, you know, um, connection and, and dynamics with um, the bigger enterprise. Um, and so, you know, the, I think to, of course, there's always going to be that kind of time period where as we are transitioning and as we're integrating integrating such a complex set of systems, it will take a little bit of an impact. But I mean, our right. our hope um, and our philosophy is that it doesn't impact, um, mm -hmm. you know, because it doesn't impact our clinical trials, it doesn't impact our investigators and, of course, on the customer side as well. Um, but um, of course, um, you know, that is one element. But then on the positive side, you know, we are diversifying our expertise. We are now, you know, kind of being able to interact with different therapeutic areas. And, and you know, although people would say with what's, you know, immunology got to do with aesthetic medicine, there are definite <laughs> connections. Um, and what's really exciting is um, the, the setup from a genomics um, and a genetics point of view in the AbV side of thing. And that's something that absolutely can be applied to aesthetic medicine. I and mean, we're talking about precision medicine. That's something that, you know, when we're talking about innovation and um, there, there's definitely avenues that we can be applying this and, and ultimately kind of better set us up to be able to speak to the individual needs rather than you know looking at the um, you know cohorts of patients at large rather than really understanding what we can what we can continue to um, develop so I think you know there's always going to be the the challenges but you know from a from a bigger picture point of view it's it's it, you know there are just so many opportunities and and um, you know that's something that we're all very very keen to make sure we're maximizing those opportunities. Oh, that's wonderful. Very well said. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know from where you sit in the past 15 years or so, how do you think the biotech industry has changed and what can we do to get better? So, oh, then that is a great question. I mean, biotech is really, you know, the transition in the last 15 years, I think it's, it's become a really powerful group um, of companies and, and, you know, kind of the, the I guess, the um, source of development of some really incredible and exciting um, assets and, and products and compounds. And I think that that's something that, you know, uh, the bigger old school pharmaceutical um, industry approach was very much in-house um, development. Mm -hmm. And this is where there has been that opportunity to, to open out and to kind of make those um, external partnerships. And, and, you know, whether that is, you know, in the form of acquisitions or mergers or looking at, you know, just supporting from an earlier stage through partnerships. Um, and so I think from that point of view, you know, the, the, the biotech industry has really become um, one of the kind of the, the, the major, um, you know, sources of development of innovation and, and that's something we cannot ignore and so I think you know moving forward it is very much and I think about you know what can be done to support kind of the continued um, this continued area is is I think partnerships are really key mm -hmm. and it's about being really mm -hmm. clear as to kind of when to um, you know look for that external partnership and external funding and investment um, and you know when you say what can we do better I think that's a great question because yeah. I, I think you know, the, from from the track record of recent years, you know, the biotech are really the ones who are shaking up the industry and actually demonstrating um, how, um, you know, we can bring, um, you know, the, 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 you know, you know, compounds, molecules and technologies um, to better I think mirror what's actually required out there and, and really kind of to reflect what um, the unmet needs are from a patient's point of view and a, and a therapeutic's point of view. Um, and I think that there's such a great um, opportunity as well for these um, companies and, and the, in earlier stages to be using platforms to really kind of discuss their technology to, to share that. I guess, I mean, sometimes some of the things is just, um, you know, when we're looking at and um, evaluating the opportunity, it just need to be really clear at what stage they are and, you know, at the early and vitro stage that's obviously there's a lot more work needs to be done to kind of fully understand the translatability of the opportunity um so you know from from that perspective and and it's interesting i was just looking at this from a longevity point of view I mean, there's a lot of um, very small <clears throat> biotechs and startups in this area and i think you know if there is any communication especially out to the public it just needs to be very much clearly articulated right what right, you right. know where the studies have been conducted and then in a little bit more of a I think transparency rather than mm -hmm. trying to hype it up because I think that mm -hmm. that in itself can be a little bit um 
you know, I think it comes under, I guess, some question as to kind of how to um, communicate with the wider public. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think it's such an exciting space and, and it's something that, you know, I feel that my, my experience has been with the bigger companies. And um, mm -hmm. so I think definitely it's, it's my opportunity to work with them, um, partners who are in the biotech and um, gives me some insight into, you know, just the development process and, and the interactions and the infrastructure from that point of view. And I think that there's, yeah, there's a lot of exciting things happening. I think, again, you, you articulated that very elegantly, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. We, we started out by talking about innovation, the role that serendipity plays, the importance of building partnerships, synergies, and, and just thinking about innovation holistically. And, and so I guess my final question is very simple. Um, is there anything else that you would like to talk about, any commentary, any thoughts, anything that we might have missed that you do think it's important to emphasize? Side. Oh my goodness! Well, do you know what I think? I think we've covered quite a lot. I mean, it's been an absolute joy just speaking to you. I mean, the time has gone so quickly. And it's, been, it's been it's been brilliant. Um, um, and I've really enjoyed speaking to you, Sophia. I mean, I'm sure when we finish, there'll be lots of things that come to my mind. That I think, oh, you know, I wish I'd said this, or are we kind of maybe um, landed upon another subject? But um, yeah, I mean, I think I think just I guess my closing statement was would be is that there's a lot happening and a, and a, a bit of a plug for aesthetic medicine but there's a lot of really exciting <laughs> um aspects happening there and and um you know just maybe make a plug for science of aging because we do have a linkedin community so please come like sophia dick please come and join us on the linkedin community and also on instagram if that's your um social media um channel of choice um because we'd love to kind of just continue to grow the community with them um, you know academics like sophia and, and also look at um, expanding it out in the aesthetic medicine um, you know, healthcare professional arena as well. So it's been an absolute pleasure to speaking with you, Sophia. The feeling is mutual. And again, I fell in love with Science of Aging just by checking out the LinkedIn page. And I attended the symposium and I was blown away. But perhaps most importantly, what I really appreciate about this conversation is your candor, the, the simplicity and the ease of speaking with you. It, it makes a difference. And I hope that there will be more leaders in the industry who, like yourself, look at issues like diversity in clinical trials and say, let's do something about it. So thank you for what you do we see we appreciate it and uh, it, it makes a difference well it's lovely to speak to a, a leader in science like yourself and also celebrating females um, in this space so great yeah. <laughs> wonderful <it> thank you <laughs> i appreciate it and i look forward to reconnecting again soon me too me too All right, thank you bye Thanks, Sophia. bye